There was no Latin word for volcano, the concept didn't exist. So, when Mount Vesuvius detonated with the force of 100,000 nuclear bombs, the 16,000 people who died had no framework for what was killing them. They couldn't name it. They couldn't predict it. They'd been ignoring warning signs for 17 years, because the warning signs were for a disaster that hadn't been invented yet. Somewhere in that chaos, a man sat down on a public toilet and never stood up. He's still there. 2,000 years later, frozen mid-squat, he's become the most undignified immortal in human history. And somehow, he's not even the saddest thing we found. They had 17 years of warning and did absolutely nothing. Here's the thing about Pompeii that nobody talks about. It wasn't a surprise. In 62 AD, a massive earthquake rattled the city so hard that temples crumbled, public buildings collapsed, and the water infrastructure got absolutely wrecked. Seneca the Younger wrote about it extensively, noting that sheep dropped dead from toxic fumes escaping the ground. Sheep, just keeling over in fields. If your livestock starts spontaneously dying from invisible poison, that's your sign to pack up and move to literally anywhere else. But the Pompeians? They rebuilt, they patched things up. Construction was still ongoing 17 years later when Vesuvius finally had enough. The city was essentially a perpetual renovation site, with scaffolding on buildings and half-finished repairs everywhere. Workers were actively fixing damage from the 62 AD quake, the very morning everything went sideways. Some of those bodies they've excavated were holding tools. They died mid-repair, which is honestly the most frustrating way to go. Imagine spending years renovating your house only for the universe to delete the entire zip code. The Romans didn't even recognize Vesuvius as a volcano. To them, it was just a very fertile mountain with spectacular soil for vineyards. The Greek geographer Strabo had written about its volcanic nature decades earlier, but apparently nobody in Pompeii subscribed to that particular newsletter. They had no concept of volcanic eruptions. The word volcano wouldn't even exist for another 1,500 years, derived from Vulcan, the Roman god of fire. They saw a mountain covered in grapevines, producing some of the finest wines in the Mediterranean, and thought, perfect. Let's build a luxury resort town here. The hubris is almost impressive. The morning started completely normal, which is the cruelest part. The 24th of August, 79 AD. Or maybe the 24th of October. Scholars have been bickering about this for decades, with an intensity that suggests they need hobbies. The traditional August date comes from a manuscript of Pliny the Younger's letters, but some copies say October. Recent archaeological evidence found autumn fruits and heating braziers in use, suggesting the later date. Pomegranates don't ripen until September. Braziers don't get lit in August Mediterranean heat. Either way, the morning was gorgeous. Clear skies, perfect weather. Around 20,000 people going about their business in a thriving Roman resort town completely unaware they were living the last normal hours of their lives. The excavated remains tell us exactly what people were doing. Bread was baking in commercial ovens. Meals were being prepared across the city. Prostitutes were entertaining clients in the city's many brothels, as evidenced by the rather specific positions some bodies were found in. One guy was apparently caught mid-bowel movement in a public latrine. He's been frozen in that exact position for nearly 2,000 years. Fame comes for us all in different ways, and his particular immortality is absolutely nobody's first choice. The forum was bustling with morning activity. Merchants were selling goods from stalls. Politicians were doing whatever Roman politicians did, probably accepting bribes and giving speeches nobody wanted to hear. The amphitheater was quiet that morning, but street vendors were setting up for the day's business. Someone was painting an advertisement for upcoming gladiator games on a wall. We found it. It was never finished. The paint dried mid-stroke. Around noon, small earthquakes started. But small earthquakes were just background noise in this region. Nobody panicked. Nobody should have panicked, based on everything they knew. The mountain had been making weird noises for days, maybe weeks. Springs were drying up mysteriously. The ground was slightly warmer in places. Wells that had flowed for generations suddenly went empty. All signs that meant absolutely nothing to people who had no frame of reference for what was about to happen. You can't prepare for a disaster category that doesn't exist in your worldview. 1 p.m., when the mountain exploded its own top off. At approximately 1, 0 inches the afternoon, Mount Vesuvius detonated with a force equivalent to 100,000 Hiroshima bombs. The top third of the mountain simply ceased to exist, replaced by a column of ash, pumice, and superheated gas that shot roughly 33 kilometers into the stratosphere. For context, commercial airplanes cruise at about 10 kilometers. This thing punched through that altitude without slowing down. Weather happens below 12 kilometers. This eruption was happening above weather. Pliny the Younger, watching from Messinum about 35 kilometers away, described the cloud as resembling a Mediterranean pine tree. 
It shot straight up on a trunk of volcanic material, then spread out at the top where the atmosphere stopped it. His description is so accurate that this type of eruption is now scientifically called Plinian. The 18-year-old kid watching his world end accidentally named a category of natural disaster. His observational skills were better than most modern journalism. The sound would have been beyond comprehension. Modern estimates suggest it registered around 200 decibels at the source. For reference, a jet engine at close range is about 140 decibels. Above 185 decibels, sound waves create a shockwave that can kill you outright by pulverizing your internal organs. The immediate area around the mountain was just insta-death territory. People didn't die from the sound, but they definitely would have felt it in their chests from kilometers away. But Pompeii was 8 kilometers away, just far enough to survive the initial blast, just close enough for what came next to be absolutely devastating. The citizens heard a sound unlike anything in human experience, looked up, and saw their sky being erased by a pillar of darkness ascending into the heavens. The mountain they'd lived beside their entire lives was suddenly a pillar of fire reaching toward the gods. Now would have been an excellent time to run. Many didn't. The first three hours, death by falling rocks. The eruption column didn't just go up. What goes up must come down, and Vesuvius was throwing pumice stones the size of golf balls into the atmosphere by the ton. The prevailing winds pushed this material southeast, directly toward Pompeii. By 2 p.m., rocks were raining from the sky. Herculaneum, northwest of the volcano, was spared the pumice entirely due to wind direction. Pompeii got absolutely hammered. Pumice is volcanic stone filled with air bubbles, so it's relatively light. Getting hit by one piece wouldn't kill you. Getting hit by thousands per minute, hour after hour, while trying to navigate through ankle-deep, and then knee-deep, and then waist-deep accumulation, that would absolutely do it. The pumice fell at a rate of approximately 15 centimeters per hour. Roof started collapsing under the accumulated weight within the first two hours. Roman roof construction was not designed for this particular stress test. This is when the first wave of deaths occurred. People sheltered indoors, thinking they were safe from the falling debris, only to have their ceilings crush them. The bodies found in lower levels of buildings, beneath collapsed roofing material, died in these early hours. They made a reasonable choice based on available information. It just happened to be the wrong one. Sometimes good decisions kill you anyway. Others tried to flee immediately and had better luck. The roads out of Pompeii were quickly buried. Wheeled vehicles became useless within an hour. Anyone who escaped had to do it on foot, covering their heads with pillows, cushions, or whatever padding they could grab, navigating through a landscape where visibility dropped to nearly zero. The pumice storm blocked out the sun, day became night, and the mountain kept throwing rocks with tireless enthusiasm. Archaeological evidence shows people making desperate choices in the chaos. One family grabbed their valuables and made it to the harbor, where they died waiting for boats that couldn't dock in the conditions. Another group huddled in a wine cellar, hoping to wait out the storm, the cellar collapsed on them. A gladiator, still wearing his leg armor, was found with a woman dripping in gold jewelry. They weren't in the gladiator barracks. Make of that what you will. 5 p.m. to midnight. The waiting game from hell. By late afternoon, Pompeii was buried under about 2.8 meters of pumice. The city hadn't been destroyed so much as gradually entombed. People who had survived the initial fall were now stuck in a hostile landscape of loose volcanic rock, toxic air, and absolute darkness. The sun had disappeared behind the ash cloud. The only light came from lightning storms generated by the eruption column's electrical charge, illuminating the landscape in brief, terrifying flashes. This is where Pliny the Elder enters the story. He was the commander of the Roman fleet at Misenum, and also history's most dedicated nerd. When his sister pointed out the strange cloud over Vesuvius, his first reaction was scientific curiosity. He ordered a ship prepared so he could observe the phenomenon up close, already dictating notes to a secretary. Then rescue messages started arriving from friends near the eruption zone. Scientific expedition became rescue mission. Pliny the Elder sailed directly toward an active volcanic eruption because people needed help and he had boats. His nephew stayed behind because he had homework to finish. Sometimes history survivors are just lucky procrastinators with pressing academic obligations. The Elder Pliny reached Stabiae, a town south of Pompeii, where conditions were deteriorating rapidly but hadn't yet become lethal. He ate dinner, took a bath, and went to sleep allegedly to calm the terrified household he was staying with. Whether this was bravery, fatalism, or an old man being incredibly tired, we'll never know. The pumice kept falling, buildings groaned under the weight, and the mountain prepared its final, devastating act. The pyroclastic surges, when the real killing started. After midnight, on the 25th of August, the eruption column collapsed. The material that had been shooting upward suddenly had nowhere to go but down and outward. 
superheated gases, ash, and rock fragments came screaming down the slopes of Vesuvius at speeds exceeding 100 km per hour. The temperature exceeded 300 degrees Celsius. This was pyroclastic flow, and it was unsurvivable. Nothing that breathes oxygen can survive those conditions. Nothing. The first surge hit Herculaneum, a smaller town closer to the volcano. Those residents died within seconds. The heat was so intense that brain tissue literally boiled inside skulls, causing them to explode from internal pressure. We've found the evidence. Star patterned fractures in craniums where cerebrospinal fluid flash vaporized. It's the kind of death you don't have time to register. One moment you exist. The next moment you're a crime scene. Pompeii, slightly farther away and protected by the first ridge of accumulated pumice, survived the first few surges. But around 6.30 a.m., a surge reached the city with enough force to kill everyone, still breathing. Anyone still alive in Pompeii at that moment died within seconds. No exceptions. No survival stories. The surge was less hot by the time it reached the city, maybe around 200 degrees Celsius, which is still roughly the temperature of a convection oven on high. You cannot breathe 200 degree air. This is how the famous casts were made. Bodies were buried in ash that hardened around them. When the flesh decomposed over centuries, it left hollow cavities in the exact shape of human forms. In the 1860s, archaeologist Giuseppe Fiorelli started filling these cavities with plaster, creating haunting replicas of Pompeii's final moments. We have mothers clutching children. We have dogs still chained to posts, twisted in agony. We have a man covering his face with his hands, as if that would help. The casts are both scientific evidence and accidental portraiture. Pliny the Elder, How to Die While Taking Notes The Elder Pliny never made it out. When the pyroclastic surges started descending toward Stabiae, everyone in the household fled toward the beach, hoping to escape by sea. The volcanic debris made it impossible. The sea itself was churning with pumice, making navigation dangerous. Pliny, who was overweight and suffered from chronic respiratory problems, collapsed on the shore. When his companions returned two days later to recover his body, he was lying peacefully, apparently undamaged. He looked more asleep than dead, his clothes undisturbed. Modern analysis suggests he probably died from a heart attack, triggered by the toxic gases and physical exertion, not from direct thermal exposure. The sulfur dioxide in the air would have been especially brutal on asthmatic lungs. He was 55 years old, which was ancient by Roman standards, and he'd spent his entire life working obsessively on an encyclopedia of natural history. His Naturalist Historia runs to 37 volumes. He died the way he lived, investigating something that would probably kill him, still curious until the end. His nephew's account of these events, written years later in letters to the historian Tacitus, is the only surviving eyewitness testimony of the eruption. Pliny the Younger was 18 when he watched the mountain kill his uncle, bury entire cities, and blot out the sun for days. He wrote about the screaming crowds, the earthquakes, the darkness that wasn't night, but the absence of light itself. He wrote about his mother urging him to leave her behind so he could escape faster. He wrote about finally making it to safety and waiting for days, not knowing if the world itself was ending. The letters are remarkable because they're so clinical. He describes horror with the precision of a naturalist cataloging specimens. Maybe that's how he processed it. Maybe that's the only way to write about watching 16,000 people die without losing your mind completely. The body count and the bodies we found. Between Pompeii and Herculaneum, approximately 16,000 people died. That's the estimate. The actual number is impossible to know because many fled successfully, many bodies remain undiscovered beneath unexcavated sections, and some were likely vaporized completely by the pyroclastic flows. We've excavated roughly 1,150 bodies from Pompeii and about 350 from Herculaneum. About a third of Pompeii remains unexcavated. The digging continues, slowly and carefully. The positions tell stories. About 38% of Pompeii's victims show signs of death by building collapse in the early hours, killed by the weight of pumice on roofs. The remaining 62% died in the pyroclastic surges, their bodies found in the ash layer above the pumice. Some were caught mid-stride, trying to run. Others were crouched in corners, seeking shelter that didn't exist. One group of about 50 people was found in the basement of a large building, all huddled together. They survived the pumice. They didn't survive the surge. The most chilling detail is how well-preserved everything is. We have bread still in ovens, carbonized but intact with the baker's marks visible. We have eggs that were being prepared for a meal. We have graffiti on walls, political slogans and love notes and crude jokes that could have been written yesterday. One message reads, Gaius Pumidius Diphilus was here. Another says, I don't want to sell my husband. Some things absolutely never change. Herculaneum's victims are in even better condition because the pyroclastic material there was wetter, forming a tighter seal around the bodies. 
We have intact skeletons with bone marrow still analyzable. We have remnants of brain tissue. We have a wooden bed with carved decorations, preserved because the heat carbonized it rather than burning it. Time stopped so completely in these cities that we can reconstruct individual lives down to their last meals. Stomach contents are scientific data now. The aftermath nobody talks about. The eruption lasted about 19 hours total. When it finally stopped, both cities were buried under approximately 5 to 6 meters of volcanic debris. The landscape was unrecognizable. Rivers had changed course. The coastline had shifted dramatically, pushing the sea back hundreds of meters. The mountain itself had lost its peak, replaced by a caldera that would eventually refill with another volcanic cone. Emperor Titus, who had just taken the throne two months earlier, organized relief efforts. He appointed two former consuls to oversee aid distribution and diverted treasury funds to help survivors. It was one of history's first organized disaster responses by a government. Unfortunately, there wasn't much to respond to. The survivors had fled to neighboring towns. The dead couldn't be helped. The cities themselves were too deeply buried to excavate with Roman technology. You can't dig through six meters of volcanic rock with bronze shovels. People did try to tunnel back in, probably to recover valuables. We found evidence of these early excavations. Holes in walls, rooms obviously ransacked, valuable items missing from wealthy homes. Some of these treasure hunters may have been survivors returning for family heirlooms. Others were just opportunistic looters, because disasters bring out both the best and worst in humanity simultaneously. Several probably died when their tunnels collapsed in the unstable debris. The volcano kept taking lives even after it finished erupting. Within a generation, the exact locations of Pompeii and Herculaneum were forgotten. The names survived in records, but the cities themselves became legends, stories of a punishment from the gods. Local farmers discovered that the volcanic soil was incredibly fertile and started growing crops over buried streets. It would be 17 centuries before anyone found them again, and by then, the whole thing was mythology. What Vesuvius taught us about being wrong? The eruption of 79 AD fundamentally shaped how we understand volcanic disasters. Every modern emergency protocol for volcanic eruptions traces back, directly or indirectly, to what went wrong in Pompeii. Evacuate early. Don't shelter in buildings. Don't assume the danger is over because the noise stopped. Most importantly, don't live next to volcanoes. Though that last one, humanity has collectively chosen to ignore. Vesuvius is still active. About 3 million people currently live in its immediate danger zone, making it the most densely populated volcanic region on Earth. Naples sprawls across the landscape the mountain has already proven it can destroy. The volcano last erupted in 1944, destroying several villages and giving Allied forces during World War II an unexpected additional enemy to deal with. It was a relatively small eruption. The mountain was just clearing its throat. Scientists monitor Vesuvius constantly. They've installed seismographs, GPS sensors, and gas detectors across the mountain. Emergency evacuation plans exist for the region, theoretically capable of moving 600,000 people in 72 hours. Whether those plans would actually work is untested and probably untestable. You can't practice evacuating 600,000 people without actually evacuating them. The Pompeians didn't know what a volcano was. We have no such excuse. We've studied the 79 AD eruption exhaustively. We know exactly what the mountain can do. We've built our cities directly on top of the evidence. And every day that passes without an eruption is another day people become more comfortable living in the blast zone, more convinced that history won't repeat itself. Vesuvius still sits there, by the way, sleeping but definitely not dead, getting a little more pressurized every year. Naples exists in that strange space between historical awareness and willful optimism that defines human civilization. Every morning, three million people wake up, look at a mountain that once ate entire cities for breakfast, and think, today's probably fine, 